All right, let's get uh, started from where we left off last uh, class period. We were talking about the canopy of water above the atmosphere. This is known as the canopy theory. Now, the canopy, whatever was up there, is now gone. So this is not something we can show you or test or demonstrate or prove. It's only a theory, but I think it's a very reasonable theory. The Bible talks about the water above the atmosphere. It mentions it in Psalm 148 as waters that be above the atmosphere, above the heaven, meaning there might still be a canopy of water above the stars. Since nobody knows how far it goes, uh, we'll have to just wait till we get to heaven and figure that out. I forget what one guy said. Well, what if it isn't up there when you get to heaven? I said, well, you know, I'll try to get the message down to you wherever you are at the time to tell you about it. <laughs> well, definitely, the Earth today has six distinct layers, and everybody in, does rocket scientists or Earth science or atmospheric science uh, will tell you, yes, there are six layers to the Earth. It's a good thing, too. The... Uh, Layering to the atmosphere, we have an ozone layer that blocks out certain things. And each of these layers does different things for us. Uh, for one thing, just the thickness of it is an insulating blanket that burns up most of the stuff coming in from space. Meteors, etc., they burn up in the atmosphere. Without that, it'd be just like the moon. You know, the full force of the meteor hits, you get nothing to slow it down. They say about five uh, meteorites hit the Earth every day that are uh, as big as maybe a softball. Since the Earth is 70% water, of course, 70% of them land in the water. Now, occasionally, people get hit by them. It has happened. Uh, buildings get hit by them more frequently. But uh, this canopy uh, that's, I think, alluded to in the Bible, and we'll give you the evidence for and against the canopy theory tonight. Uh, if there was a layer of water above the atmosphere, certain, certain uh, electromagnetic frequencies cannot penetrate water. Visible light goes right through, radio waves go right through, but ultraviolet light and X-ray radiation cannot penetrate through water. So the theory goes that this canopy above would do several things for the Earth. It would increase the air pressure, and it would filter out the sunlight and give you none of the harmful effects of the sunlight. So this to talk about the canopy theory. The Bible also says there was a layer of water under the crust of the Earth. It says in Psalm 136, to him that stretched out the earth above the waters. You never hear that verse preached on, and I don't know how long it took me to catch that that's in there, but I thought, wait a minute. He stretched out the earth above the waters. What is this saying here? Now, some idiots have tried to say, see, the Bible teaches the earth is flat and it's on top of a layer of water. That's not what it says. It doesn't say the earth is flat, does it? The Bible clearly says the earth is round. Psalm 24 the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein, for he hath founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. There's another verse indicating when God first made the world, it was built on top of a great body of water. So there must have been more water inside the earth. Now, those who object to the canopy theory, the biggest objection they get, and I, I talk to many people who do not like the canopy theory. I shouldn't say many. There are a few creationists who don't accept the canopy theory. They will say, the reason is, if, it, if you had enough water up over the atmosphere to rain down and cover Mount Everest, the heat generated would cook the world. Now, see, when moisture turns to water and condenses, it releases heat. If you're turning water into moisture to boil it, you have to, it absorbs heat. So when something changes from a solid to a liquid to a gas, there's a heat exchange. So when going from a vapor to a liquid is called the latent heat of condensation. That might be a good bonus quiz question. Uh, latent heat of condensation, it releases heat. Even though it turns to water and it falls down and it feels cool when it hits you, it's actually released heat to go from the vapor to the liquid state. You have to release heat, you have to take heat away to get something to go from a liquid to a solid state. Freezing. Okay, so here's their objection. Enough water to cover Mount Everest condensing would fry the world. What are the errors in that logic? You're assuming you have to cover Mount Everest. Mount Everest wasn't there, right. And all of these straw men, these scoffers set up, you know, uh, are easy to, if, you, if you look at it. Wait a minute, Mount Everest wasn't there. The Bible says in Psalm 104, during the last part of the flood, the mountains arose. The mountains weren't there. What's the second problem with this? They're assuming all the water came from up above. Well, the Bible clearly says the earth was founded upon the waters, and that's where most of the water came from. 
If you read Genesis chapter 7, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. So here we have, it says the rain was upon the earth 40 days. But if you keep reading in Genesis chapter 7, you'll see the water kept coming up for 150 days. Obviously, it's not all coming from above if it's only raining for 40 days. So, they always set up a straw man and say, see, all that water to cover Mount Everest would produce so much heat. And they do all these elaborate mathematical calculations, and they're correct on their calculations about how much, uh, how many joules of heat would be, or energy would be released. and th That's all correct, but they've, they've got a straw man set up. Yeah, you're right. It would fry the earth. However, all that water didn't come from above. It only rained 40 days. And probably an awful lot of that rain during that 40-day time was being recycled because the climate was all messed up. You'd have had evaporation and you know a rainy cycle started. Some of it might have come down as rain from when the fountains of the deep broke open, the water shooting up into the atmosphere, and it's raining down. So I don't know how much actually came from the canopy. You'd only have to have... People, people argue about the thickness all the time, so I hate to hesitate to give a number. But most people say somewhere between 4 and 10 inches of ice would be sufficient to produce the effects of filtering out the radiation. Now, what held it up there is the other objection. I don't know. I don't know anybody who knows. There are a couple of theories about it. Several planets today have vapor canopies that cover them completely. Venus is covered by a cloud cover. Clouds, of course, are 100% water, and they float just fine. If you get water droplets small enough, the surface area is so great compared to the volume, they simply can't even fall. They have to have something to stick to to get enough mass together so they can fall. And you have drizzle droplets that form into, I forget the sequence, drizzle droplets to some other kind of droplets, cloud droplets to, maybe it's other way, cloud droplets to drizzle droplets to rain droplets. They have to slightly get bigger and bigger, and pretty soon they fall. Well, most of the water, I think, came from inside the crust of the earth. So the fallacy in the argument is they're assuming all the water comes from the canopy. Not true at all. Most of it came from inside the earth. The earth today still bears scars. The San Andreas Fault, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, that crack right there is a crack that was 46,000 miles long. It runs completely around the world like a seam on a baseball. And it's a real crooked path, which is why it's 46,000 miles long, and the earth's only 25,000 miles across. Around, But uh, this rip is probably one of the places where it ripped open. I read an uh, interesting article about somebody who was up in a skyscraper when the 1906 San Francisco earthquake hit. They happened to be looking out the window of their skyscraper, and they saw the ground about oh, 20 miles away. The, the whole city, the ground and everything, was rippling like a wave. Everything's just lifting up and dropping back down. And they saw this wave come, and all of a sudden their building went... <laughs> and everything fell down, and they survived it. But they described this as seeing the ground itself waving, just like the oceans. Yes, sir? I was in an earthquake that literally saw the ground go like that. Yeah, it just goes up and down. I've only seen pictures of it. You know, uh, I've been in two minor earthquakes, never, never been in a big one. But um, if they say when the, uh, one of the earthquakes that hit, hit the San Andreas Fault, they checked how fast is the crack moving. If the ground cracks here, how long does it take before the crack moves 100 miles away? And I forget, it was at phenomenal speed. It was like uh, two miles a second. That's how fast the crack moves. If you have a tightly stretched cloth, you stretch a cloth real tight, all of a sudden it begins to rip. How long does it take the rip to go all the way down? Well, it depends on all sorts of factors, you know, how tight is the cloth and how much pressure is on it, stuff like that. But the ground in earthquakes will rip at incredibly rapid speeds. So according to Walter Brown, this crack probably circled the earth in a matter of less than an hour. 46,000 miles. <laughs> I've seen uh, high-speed movies they take of balloons popping. You get a balloon and you make one hole in one spot. How long does it take for that crack to go all the way around the balloon? Not too long. <laughs> it happens pretty quickly. Or an eggshell breaking. You know, how long does it take for the crack to circle the egg? That's the kind of effect you would have here with the fountains of the deep breaking open. And the Earth today still has what's called, what are called continental plates. And when you study Earth science, you study the different plates. It's interesting that most of the volcanoes represented here by the red dots, most of them are on or near a fault line. And so their conclusion is, well, the fault line is causing the volcano. Maybe so. 
I don't know. There are a couple other theories. You want to read something very fascinating. You need to get Walter Brown's book in the beginning and just read through that, uh, his explanation of what's called the hydroplate theory about the magma being trapped when the fountains of the deep broke open. And that's still causing volcanoes today. And the likely place for it to come out is <coughs> where one of the cracks are. San Andreas Fault, I remember standing right on top of that when I was in Lompoc, California. I was driving through the country and I went over the San Andreas Fault. I stopped and you stand there and you look down both directions and you see this massive crack. And you're thinking, I mean, up these mountains beside it are, you know, really big mountains. And you're thinking, man, what if this thing had another earthquake right now? <laughs> Pretty scary thought. We were, my mom and I stayed in the motel in Alaska where they had the 1964 Alaska earthquake. It happened 30 feet away from this hotel we were in. We were up on the 13th floor, I think. The church put us up in this motel, you know. And you look out the window and they said, what happened? The whole section of the city dropped down 30 feet. So they just smoothed it out and planted grass. And, <laughs> and now there's a hill there. Where before it was just flat ground. We were just looking out the window, looking right down that hill. Just 30 feet away from here to that, you know, deck. It, San Andreas Fault varies all over the place. It finally runs out into the Pacific Ocean, just north of San Francisco, um, where you were there with the... Did you go see Muir Woods when you were out there? Petaluma, or just north of... You were there in... Uh, just a few weeks ago, right? Yeah. They say California's going to drop off into the ocean. Well, first place, it's just a little piece of California that would be affected, and it's not going to drop off. It's going to slide northward. And that's not so bad, except when it slides, all the rock, you know, moves and... Everything falls down. The crack is probably, who knows how deep it is, down to, apparently down to where it changes into liquid, maybe 20 miles, 30 miles. It's a little bit, instead of drilling, a little bit of business. Well, there have been, there have been theories tested uh, or attempted. There have been, theoretically, they thought, you know, the reason that earthquakes happen is because the plates are pushing against each other. You do an experiment where you get two blocks of wood or two things that are going to have a lot of friction, Two erasers here. If I pull one down like this, they slide past each other. What if I push them together real hard and then pull down? When it, sl when it finally builds up enough pressure, it jerks. If there wasn't any pressure holding them, it would just slide past each other. But the sliding will cause it to jerk if there's more pressure between it. So what you have here is two massive blocks of earth sliding and as they, it, they build up pressure, and all of a sudden it jerks. It may only move a foot, but the energy released, you know, knocks down buildings for 50 miles. And sometimes they move side to side this way. Other times they're, one drops down. If one drops down, it'll make a big cliff called an escarpment. They have those all over the world. Where obviously it had an earthquake and a section, you know, dropped down. There are several different types of fault lines. Uh, I used to know them when I taught earth science. It doesn't matter. You won't need it for the quiz. Okay. <coughs> yes, sir. That varies greatly. I would say the total width of this picture at the foreground here where you're looking is probably uh, two miles. It's taken from a high altitude plane. Uh, the mountain ranges, you know, you. You're driving across relatively flat terrain, and all of a sudden you see this mountains where it's been built up from probably from the abrasion of the rubbing. So what's the line down the center of it, too, it, no, it's all fills in. As soon as it cracks and slides, you know the next rainstorm fills it in with dirt, and you can't even tell it's there. Um, it's not like it's an open crack. You can look down into the earth. It's it's closed tight. They build highways over it, and when an earthquake happens, you can see a lot of places where the earth has moved, and they had to, you know, rebuild the highway because it moved over five feet. Or fences will be off by, you know, six or eight feet. So you get kind of like you got a valley running down to the center? Yeah. You drive up in the mountains, drive down the valley and up the other mountains and out the other side. And if you didn't know what you were looking at, you would think you just drove over some hills. And in some areas, the San Andreas Fault's hardly noticeable. It's not like this all the way along, but an awful lot of it is. Pretty noticeable crack in the ground. Okay. The greenhouse effect is what happens when... You have something that lets light in, and the energy is absorbed by the ground, and then it's re-emitted, and it comes off as a different kind of energy wave, and so it's trapped. It can only penetrate through the glass one way. A layer of carbon dioxide above the Earth would make what's called the greenhouse effect. 
a layer of water above the earth will do the same thing. Environmentalists are all nervous about you know, us burning all the fossil fuels and producing greenhouse gases, which is true. If we, all the cars in the world running today and all the factories burning all these fossil fuels are producing greenhouse gases that go up and they hover in the atmosphere. What they don't tell you, the people who are nervous about, you know, save the environment kind of stuff, the plants absorb this kind of stuff. In many countries, they don't have pollution control on their cars at all. They plant certain kinds of trees along the highway. It absorbs all the pollution. Norwegian maples are great at absorbing pollution. They thrive on it. So the more pollution you get, the faster the trees grow, and they absorb it faster. So <laughs> but, the, of course, the American solution is, you know, make you pay $2,000 extra for your car so it can't run as good and you can't work on it anymore. And you open the hood and you don't know what's under there. <laughs> you don't recognize a thing. <laughs> That's the way. I remember in the days when you could open the hood and you knew what, you, what you're looking at, you know. We used to work on cars all the time. But today you've got to have a computer to tell you which part of the computer's gone bad. Okay. If the Earth had a canopy of water overhead, the... Some of the scoffers or uh, skeptor, skeptics about the greenhouse or canopy theory will say it'll cause a, what's called a runaway greenhouse effect. The heat just keeps getting hotter and hotter and hotter. This room has lots of windows in it in our gazebo. Before we had the air conditioner put in, you would get the runaway greenhouse effect in here. It could be 100 outside and be 140 in here because it just gets hotter and hotter and the heat can't escape. It has to do with the long wave, I believe it's... Long wave radiation, I'll get it backwards, I know, and somebody will write me about this. Heidi, you handle the call. Because um, I didn't look this up before the class, but I, I know where to look it up. Education is knowing where to look. It's not knowing everything. It's knowing where to find everything. It's either short wave radiation comes through the glass and heats up the room, and then the long wave radiation is emitted from that and can't penetrate back through. Is that the way it is? Short wave will go through water. Long wave will not. So that's what's called the greenhouse effect. Okay. Hope you're right, because I'll get calls on this one. If you're not, <laughs> I could look it up. Carl Baugh, and I get blasted by creationists for even mentioning Carl Baugh, but he's a great godly man. You haven't met him yet, have you, Eric? Next time you drive across Texas, stop and see Carl Baugh, because there's nothing to see driving across Texas. But uh, he was pastoring a very successful church in St. Louis area, and he moved to Texas and bought some of the property where the footprints are found with dinosaur and human footprints together, and has a museum there. And he gets, you know, his, he has his share of uh, skeptics, like anybody trying to do something for the Lord, you know, you get people who want to fight against you for some reason. But he's a very nice guy. He's a godly man, loves the Lord. And I, my philosophy is, if you disagree with somebody about something, call them and talk to them first, okay, if you can. So I've talked to Carl Ball many times, been to his museum and seen it in the middle of uh, uh, Glen Rose, Texas. But he's got an interesting book out called Panorama of Creation. Now, when I talked to Walter Brown, who's also a creation scientist, he said, I know Dr. Ball very well. We've talked about this in great detail. And what he has here is some interesting speculation, but no hard evidence. Well, I understand that, and that's why we call it the canopy theory. Okay, I can't prove it to you, but it answers some basic questions. Scientists, uh, by the way, I was recommending here that you do get Carl Ball's book and read it if you're interested. It's about $10. Um, Panorama of Creation. He thinks the canopy of water overhead before the flood would cause several interesting f factors. It would be photo amplifier, which means they could see the stars better than we can. For one thing, if you ever look at, uh, you ever been on driving on the highway when it's real hot and you see the little lines coming off the highway? That's the, the hot air is distorting the, the light coming to you. Well, the air is 200 miles thick over our heads right now, and just looking at a star, you, the star twinkles because the air is bending the light coming from the star. That is known as atmospheric twinkle. Um, it actually bends the light about 0.046 arc seconds, which, you know, you have a degree and then 60 minutes in a degree and 60 seconds in a minute. So 0.046 arc seconds is not much, but, and who cares? Anyway, the uh, light gets bent coming from the stars and causes the star to twinkle. If you compressed the air down to, say, 10 miles, 10 miles is still a lot. I mean, I get up in airplanes every week, and we never get over, you know, 4 miles high or five, maybe 6 miles high. You know, 10 miles is way up there. So let's just assume that the canopy of water or ice, whatever it was, 
compressed the air down to 10 or 12 miles. Now you have much less atmospheric distortion because the air is compressed. It's not free to move. And you have no weather patterns. Because what causes the weather is you have hot air masses and cold air masses and things are moving around. And you couldn't get a thunderstorm in the Garden of Eden, I don't think. If the canopy theory is true and you had extra air pressure, you'd have perfect weather all the time. You'd have springtime all the time if the Earth were not tilted. Today, the Earth's tilted over 23 and a half degrees. That causes our seasons. If the Earth were not tilted before the flood, and I don't know if it was or wasn't, but this is just the theory, and that it was struck by something that started the flood, which I cover in video number six, that caused the Earth to wobble around and finally tilt at this new angle they're at today. Before the flood, it would have been March 21st, that type of weather, spring weather, all the time, every place on the globe. Slightly warmer at the equator and slightly colder at the poles because the Earth is still curved and the sunlight would still strike at different angles. So that would still cause some effect. There might even have been some ice caps around the poles that were smaller. There are some animals that seem to be very thoroughly designed for living in cold weather. So some people say, you know, that there was no ice before the flood. I don't know if I'd buy that or not. But they do find some enormous vegetation uh, fossils, uh, evidence of vegetation at the poles, which we get into on video number six. Anyway, they got a new theory out. This is a lack of oxygen killed the dinosaurs. Now, this article is worth reading the whole thing. Let me uh, read this to you here. Dinosaurs weren't done in by a giant asteroid, as one theory holds, but by a change in the atmosphere that meant there wasn't enough oxygen to support their inefficient respiratory systems, a new theory suggests. A new analysis of air trapped in 120 million year old amber found in east central Minnesota cast doubt on the notion that the dinosaurs starved to death after a giant asteroid hit the planet 65 million years ago, sending up dust that blocked the sun and killed plant life. Dinosaurs were already on their way out by the time the meteor uh, purportedly hit, says Gary Landis, a U.S. geological survey geologist and one of the four scientists presenting their theory at the Geological Society of America's annual meeting today. The dinosaurs did not keel over with their feet up in the air, but they found it increasingly difficult to compete in their environment. The theory also carries implications for humans because it presumes that worldwide atmospheric changes can occur 10 to 20 times faster than previously thought. Let me stop right there and make this comment. It would be a neat scrapbook to have to keep articles every time they say, this overthrows all the old theories. New fossil find, you know, overthrows previous theories. Because there would be one from every week. They're constantly overthrowing some old theory, but they don't ever quite, you know, ever learning, but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth, the Bible says. They don't ever quite get all the way to say, oh, maybe the Bible is right after all. Okay, let's continue here. Landis and his colleagues tested air found trapped in the amber in east central Minnesota. They found that the proportion of oxygen in the atmosphere fell from a high of 35% to a low of 28% within the relatively short time of between 300 and 500,000 years. It would be like taking a dinosaur for a stroll from sea level to 6,000 to 7,000 feet, Landa said. The oxygen-rich air resulted from volcanic activity, which pumped out carbon dioxide, which was converted into oxygen by plants. Now, hold it. Let's stop right there. Does he know that? I encourage kids, when I'm re I read, go to public schools and speak, I'll read through part of their textbook and I'll say, no, wait a minute, is this what the author knows or is this what he thinks? You can see where they mix, freely mix their science and their religion all the time. A lot of this is good scientific stuff, and then he mixes in his religious, well, this, is, this is what caused it. Now, wait a minute, you don't know that. Okay, let's keep going here. Oxygen-rich air resulted from volcanic activity. I don't think he knows that. Dinosaurs evolved during this time when oxygen was plentiful and had a weak respiratory system, according to the theory known as the Pele hypothesis. Pele is the Polynesian goddess of volcanoes. Now, this paragraph is important. An 80-foot apatosaurus had nostrils the same size as a horse. Now, how is an 80-foot animal going to get enough air through nostrils the same size as a horse? The two things confusing about dinosaurs are their nostrils are too small, and their lungs are too small? Those would be two good quiz questions there, Heidi. Two things that indicate dinosaurs had a different environment to breathe in. 
Smaller lungs, smaller nostrils. An 80-foot dinosaur could not survive today because he simply couldn't get enough air. You ever had a real bad cold and you could barely breathe through your nose and it's, you know how hard it is to try to get a breath, okay? Um, that would be the problem for the dinosaurs. Their nostrils are too small. We do know dinosaurs lived. We do know they got to be huge from the bones we find. The question is, when did they live? I don't think it's even worth arguing about what they look like. What color were they? I don't care. Don't know. Let them, you know, let the toy makers make them any color they want. It doesn't matter. When they live, that matters to me. Amber is petrified tree sap. There are several ways things can be preserved as fossils. One is preserved in amber. What are some other ways fossils can be made? Preserved in rock. Preserved in ice. Frozen in ice. Think of any other ways? Formaldehyde. <laughs> mummified. There have been things found mummified just dried out. They uh, you know, died in a dry climate, and so they dried out, turned to like leather, and survived just fine. A lot of fossils we find are petrified by the mineral soaking into the bone. Some are just a casting of the animal. Animal falls in the dirt, makes an impression in the dirt. The dirt hardens, but he rots. But you have the impression left behind. That's called an impression fossil. And who cares? Anyway, the insects trapped in amber, according to the article here, have 35% oxygen. Now, the air we're breathing right now is about 21% oxygen. This has been tested many times. You can take a candle burning on a little uh, container with water around it, like get a big bowl, put a candle in there, and let the candle burn, and then put a glass over it. But don't have your glass quite touch the bottom of the bowl. Leave it up just a little. As the candle burns, it'll burn up all the oxygen, and it'll actually suck water up into the jar. How many have seen that before? And you measure how much oxygen is gone, you know, and you find out about 21% of the air we're breathing is oxygen. You can also do this with a mouse on top of a little block of wood inside there, and as he breathes up all the oxygen, slowly it comes up, and the mouse, pretty soon he keels over. Then you have to do mouth-to-mouse -mouse resuscitation. Uh, but uh, the air, apparently, from this evidence, we find the air before the flood was richer in oxygen. Now, if you combine these two possibilities, richer oxygen from pre-flood, of course, I believe the amber formed from the trees that were broken during the flood. When you break a tree, sap's going to ooze out, right? During the flood, you're going to get all kinds of broken trees. And you're going to get sap oozing out every place. Insects are going to come stick on the sap. Sometimes birds are found in petrified amber. Sometimes frogs are found. Insects are by far the most common. Interesting, all the insects they find are exactly like the insects alive today. And they will say, wow, isn't it amazing? They didn't evolve at all in 80 million years. They don't even stop to consider that maybe they're not 80 million years old. You know, they don't even stop to consider that. You know, they know the evolution theory is true. This debate I was in a few weeks ago, uh, I forget who it was now, but uh, I said, what you guys have is a theory that you're convinced is true, but you just all you need now is some evidence and a mechanism for how it'll work. <laughs> you got the theory down. You, now you need some evidence and, the, and a mechanism. <laughs> but it's just so ridiculous that they believe that stuff. Doubling atmospheric pressure and increasing oxygen does some neat things to your bloodstream. Your blood has little red blood cells in there that carry oxygen. When it's oxygenated, it turns red and it goes through the lungs and picks up oxygen. And then the, the, the mechanism of how the body absorbs oxygen and releases oxygen is absolutely amazing. That would take billions of years to evolve, of course. And before it evolved, nobody, nobody lived. They all died while they, were try while they were trying to evolve this complex oxygen transport system. But uh, the oxygen, the red blood cells have a maximum carrying capacity. They can only hold so much. One of the problems was sickle cell anemia, which is a disease that only black people get. The red blood cell, instead of being shaped like a donut, it caves in so it looks like a sickle, like a part of a moon, a crescent moon. Now you have much less surface area, so it holds less oxygen. So a person with sickle cell is very likely to have a very difficult time breathing, or at least carrying oxygen to the body. And it's very often fatal, people with sickle cell. We had a girl, you don't remember her, Eric, you were too small, but a girl rode our bus in uh, uh, Illinois, in Kankakee. Uh, her mother and her father were brother and sister. 
Her mother was nine when she was born. Her father was ten. It was her incest. Okay. Well, she had sickle cell anemia. She rode our bus, sweet, godly girl, loved the little girl. She lived to be 13 years old and died. She was sick a lot during those 13 years and finally died at age 13. Sickle cell is where the, <clears throat> is where the blood cell collapses and it won't carry enough oxygen. But if you get enough pressure, not only will your hemoglobin and red blood cells carry oxygen, your plasma actually absorbs oxygen. Now, plasma is the juice that your blood is, the, the, the liquid part of the blood, not the solid part, like the platelets and the red blood cells and white blood cells. It's the liquid part. You can donate plasma. Anybody ever done that before? Donate plasma? They stick a needle in, take your blood out, and they spin it in a centrifuge, I believe, to separate the solid particles, and they put those back in. They just keep the liquid part, plasma. The advantage of using plasma is it doesn't matter what blood type you are. If a soldier is shot on the battlefield, you don't know what blood type he is, well, give him plasma. That will certainly help. You have about one pint of blood for every 15 pounds of body weight. So a 150-pound person has 10 pints of blood, a little over a gallon, a gallon and a quart. So if a guy's been shot and he's already lost, you know, four pints of blood, he's only got 10. You know, it starts to get pretty serious pretty soon. Uh, anyway, under double atmospheric pressure, plasma gets oxygen saturated. So I say in the seminar, before the flood came, if you had double the air pressure and increased oxygen, you could run for hundreds of miles without getting tired. As your body gets depleted in oxygen, you begin to cramp up, especially if your body, if you can't carry away the lactic acid from the muscles. That's what causes cramps. And who cares? It's not biology class. But anyway, Jessica McClure, and there's still a controversy today about how she ended up down in that well. She was 18 months old. There were two neighbor kids, I believe neighbor kids, that were five and six years old playing over there. Some people think, you know, they shoved her down the well. Because how do you get an 18-month-old kid down in an 8-inch pipe? Nobody knows. However she ended up down there, she was stuck in this pipe. Maybe How many saw the movie about Jessica, baby Jessica stuck in the well? They've played it on TV a couple of times. The problem is her left leg was down in the pipe, and she did the splits and was down in the pipe 20 feet down. This is an old abandoned well. I don't know how deep the pipe was altogether, but it was just amazing the way they rescued her. You know, I had to dig a tunnel beside it and chisel over. But the rock is just real, real hard rock in that region. And so they finally got her out of the well. Well, she'd been down there nearly two and a half days, 58 and a half hours in this well. Lots of her body was black from lack of circulation. You can see on the picture here the black spots where you know, blood wasn't circulating. This does the same thing as frostbite or fire. Freezing or burning has the same effect on your skin. It... Uh, destroys it and it, it dies. Lack of oxygen will do the same thing. If you ever sleep on your arm wrong or something and you wake up and it tingles real bad, ever done that? Or sleep on, sit on your foot for a long time and I uh, just tingling, that's, you've cut off the blood supply and the lack of oxygen to that, to the tissue there. Well, Jessica, after being in the well for two and a half days, they said, we're going to have to cut her leg off. One doctor said, well, hey, before we cut her leg off, let's put her in a hyperbaric chamber for a while. These were invented, I believe, just for scuba divers that come up too fast. If you're down under water, the, everything's pressurized, including the air in your lungs is pressurized, and the air in your blood gets pressurized. So after you're down under water swimming around, every, your body gets used to this pressure, and you feel just great. But if you come up real fast, those little tiny air bubbles in your blood grow because the pressure's let off. If you put a balloon in a pressurized chamber, the balloon will shrink down. When you relieve the pressure, the balloon will come back up. It responds to the pressure. What's happening in your blood, these little tiny air bubbles are going around. No problem. Everything's fine. But blood vessels come along, and they split and branch off like tree branches. Every time they split, they get smaller. Eventually, you get out to the capillaries, which are extremely tiny. And there's zillions of those all over your body. Well, you have an air bubble that normally flows right through your capillaries and everything, but now it's four times normal size. It's going to come along and plug up the hole because it can't fit through the hole. Well, wherever that blood was going is now not getting any blood. And so what ends up happening when a person gets what's called the bends, they get so many of these thousands of little air bubbles all over in their body, it's plugging up capillaries or 
arteries every place, and just, it shuts down their circulation. The heart's still pumping, but it, it's, you shut the valves off. It can't go anywhere. And so you got two solutions. Get them cold. In the old days, they would take scuba divers that come up too fast and got this disease. They call it the bends. They would put them in ice, put them in a bathtub full of ice. What happens to air when it gets cold? It shrinks. A little more humane solution is put them in a chamber and pressurize it. Now, you have to be careful because when you change pressure on the body, things get hurt. Your eardrums, a little piece of skin with air on both sides of it. You build up pressure on the outside, it's going to pop in. You build up pressure on the inside, it's going to pop out. Now, to equalize the pressure, anybody know what the little names of the little tubes are that help equalize the pressure in your ears? Eustachian tubes. Little tiny tube, you won't need that for the quiz, but they go from the inside of your eardrum to the inside of your nasal cavities. So if you're going up and down the mountains, you know, and you're getting ears are hurting, you hold your nose and blow. By doing that, it blows air through these eustachian tubes and equalizes the pressure. A little rabbit trail, I like to chase rabbits. When babies are born, they're this, the, the slope of the eustachian tube is different because their nose is a different height than their ears. As you grow, these change position a little bit. So in babies, the ears are, the eustachian tubes are pointed down just a little. So any infection gets in there, runs out to the ears. As an adult, it's going to change position and it's going to run into your nasal cavities and you swallow it and you never, you never notice it. So the solution, if the eardrums, or if it's packed, if the eustachian tube is packed from this fluid behind the uh, ears, the kids are going to get ear infections. Any pressure changes, the eardrum <laughs> stretches and the kid screams, ah, because it's hurting. Your eardrum is stretching. Many years ago, the, you know, teachers would box, they'd say, I'm going to box your ears. Come up behind some kid and bam, slap the side of his head. Now what's going to happen? You got a column of air right here that you are now compressing <laughs> suddenly. It's going to split the eardrum going in, right? Thomas Edison had his ears boxed as a kid and was nearly deaf the rest of his life, which is why a lot of his inventions had to do with hearing type things to help people hear better because somebody boxed his ears. Okay, we'll get into more Jessica in just a moment. Let's take about a three or four minute break. All right, let's talk more about these hyperbaric chambers. This one holds one person. They slide the person in. It's all glass so the person doesn't get too claustrophobic. But these were used, maybe even developed, for people who got the disease called the bends. That's from coming up too fast, relieving the pressure, air bubbles build up, shuts off blood supply, and you die from lack of circulation to the various tissues. Uh, baby Jessica was put into a hyperbaric chamber, pressurized to 2.18 atmospheres. Now, in America, we measure our tire pressure in so many pounds per square inch. In most of the rest of the world, they measure it in atmospheres. If you go check your tire pressure at the gas station in Germany, they'll stick the gauge on and say, you got two atmospheres. Well, what is that? OK. One atmosphere is 14.7 pounds. That's at sea level. There's, because there's enough air above us right now that we're, we're, we're living at the bottom of an ocean of air. If you get up to the top of the ocean of air, you'll be gasping for breath. You won't be able to breathe up there. And if you leave, you'll really be gasping for breath. Uh, the pressure of this column of air 200 miles thick over us is about 14 and a half pounds, 14.7 pounds per square inch. That's an enormous amount of pressure. If you figure how many square inches of body you have, that's an awful lot of pressure. If you take a can and you remove all the air from inside, it'll cave in just because of the air pressure. You do these experiments where you can, you know, uh, drop a piece of burning cloth or burning uh, paper inside a can and put the lid on. As it burns, it creates a vacuum, slight vacuum, removes 20% of the oxygen, sides cave in. Did that stuff for science class all the time. Okay, they put Jessica in one of these chambers and filled it up full of pure oxygen to 2.18 atmospheres. Within a few hours of forcing oxygen into her system, her leg turned pink, most of her skin was saved, what would have, would have uh, been a very serious illness or a very serious problem from all the lack of uh, oxygen turned out to be fine. The largest chamber in America that I've been able to find is in Pensacola, Florida, University Parkway. In an emergency, they can hold 30 people at a time. There are over 400 hyperbaric chambers in America now. The vast majority are located along the coastlines. Why would that be? 
That's where most of the scuba divers are going to be, right? Many big cities, though, are getting hyperbaric centers, hyperbaric treatment. I called these folks here. There's their phone number, 850-969-7990. Uh, and they said, you have to get a doctor's order to get in there. You can't just go try it out. And it's about $16,000 for a complete set of treatments, which is two and a half hours, I believe, per treatment and 20 treatments, if I have my facts, or something close to that. So two and a half hours times 20, how many hours are you in there? 50 hours for $16,000, $800 an hour. And they're going to pump it up to high-pressure oxygen. You could do a similar effects, not quite the same. Uh, they do it just by getting helmets, like diver's helmets, like the old-fashioned big metal helmets the scuba divers would wear, and pressurize just what you're breathing. In no sense pressurizing your arm. I mean, it's, it's not absorbing any oxygen anyway. So you probably could do this a lot cheaper. And some places have just the pressurized hyperbaric helmets that you wear. Um, in West Germany, they're treating stroke patients with hyperbaric treatments. Because a stroke is a blood clot or something that stops circulation to part of the brain. And so it's, since it's lack of circulation is the problem, you pressurize oxygen and healing takes place much faster. In England, they're treating multiple sclerosis with hyperbaric treatments and getting amazing results. In France, they're treating uh, diseases like arthritis with simply forcing oxygen into the system. In India, they treat leprosy. There's a couple of websites here, uh, hyperbaric.com, if you want to check it out to learn more about hyperbaric treatments, or uh, the um, email hyperbaric1 at earthlink.net, but you can get information. Yes, sir. Who has one? Two thirds of the time? Duke University? And they conduct surgery inside the chamber. So the doctor and everybody's pressurized. Interesting. This is a fascinating article. I'm tempted to read the whole thing. Let me just read you a few key ingredients out of here. Uh, oxygen halves or cuts in half the infection rate. They said right here the air is about 21% oxygen, but patients routinely get 30% oxygen during and after surgery because. Lungs don't work well under anesthesia. The study tested whether a richer mixture would improve uh, the outcome. It says they boosted oxygen to 80%, and it made a tremendous difference. Normally, surgery is done with a patient breathing oxygen, but he's only breathing 30%. They said, let's try it at 80%. Everybody was worried the lungs would collapse, but they found absolutely no problems in the study. It tells about it here. Um, just released a few months ago. This says in this uh, circle here, there was also an unexpected benefit. Patients who got extra oxygen were half as likely to be nauseated after surgery. Interesting. And it's just fascinating to read the whole thing about, uh, I would recommend when you get, the, if you get the videotape, just hit pause right there and, and read that article because it's really interesting. This is a small chamber that only holds one person. A lot of professional teams have their own hyperbaric chamber. Dallas Cowboys have one. New York Jets. Now, why does, a co why does a football team need a hyperbaric chamber? Promotes healing. Exactly correct. And they've discovered, sure enough, their injured players will heal twice as fast. Now, you figure it's going to cost them roughly five to $800 per treatment to put the guy in there. But if that gets him back on the field three weeks earlier, and you're paying him $10,000 a minute to go out there and play with that ball, you don't care what it costs to get him well. You want him well, right? Uh, you want to get your own chamber to keep at home? This is a hyperbaric sleeping bag. Michael Jackson has, Michelle Jackson has one of these. Uh, so it's going to make him live forever. You can't quite get up to double atmospheric pressure. But you do get much higher oxygen. Well, well it's got a little oxygen cylinder. It pumps it in. You have to. You can go to welding supply shops and get a bottle of oxygen. I got one in our bedroom. Remember, we had one for mom. We just took the hose while she was, you know, healing from this tailbone injury. We would just, you know, sleep with oxygen just barely flowing, just to increase the oxygen in the room. It wasn't pressurized. You know, it didn't uh, didn't see any dramatic results. But uh, adding oxygen to the system helps. Some there's a clinic in Dallas. Um, it's in my seminar notebook. If you get the seminar notebook, the section in there about cancer called oxidative therapy. One of the things they use to help treat people with of all sorts of diseases is add hydrogen peroxide to their water and drink it. 
Hydrogen peroxide is H2O2. It's, water is H2O, so hydrogen peroxide is an extra oxygen is all it is. And when it breaks down, it turns into oxygen and water. I've drank it many times, not pure. You know, I'll take a glass of water. And now, if you get, you know, Walmart hydrogen peroxide, it's only 3%. 97% of what you buy is, you're buying a bottle of water, 3% is hydrogen peroxide. At some drugstores, you can still get 30% hydrogen peroxide. That's the strongest I've heard of uh, available, uh, you know, over the counter. But some of the drugstores in the old days, they would sell hydrogen peroxide, 30%, and people would, you know, just rub it on their head and bleach their hair out. If you gargle with hydrogen peroxide straight out of the bottle from Walmart, it's only 3%, it kills, you feel your mouth foaming up, all the germs and stuff are being killed. There's, what's the toothpaste that, uh, you know, it's got the, hydrogen peroxide is a big thing now to add into toothpaste because it kills germs. And germs are a living organism. Germs get on your teeth from the food you ate, and they're attacking the food, trying to break it down. They're doing their job. The problem is the germ is a living, breathing organism. Eats sleeps, reproduces, and goes potty. But guess where he goes potty at? In your mouth. That's where he's living. And so that's the primary cause of bad breath is bacteria doo-doo. Uh, good motivation to brush your teeth when you're done eating, right? Oh, you got a few bacteria in there, don't you? Yeah. Uh, there's a website that sells all sorts of things, you know, but uh, topicsgallery.com, T-O-P-I-X, if you want to read more on hyperbaric chambers. Just listen to this one testimony. This person says, I have never felt healthier or more rejuvenated than I did stepping out of this chamber for the first time. My skin was tingling. My nerves were calm for once. And I had a clarity of mind unfettered by stress and worry. We may not have found the proverbial fountain of youth here, but this is as close as it gets. By increasing the uptake of oxygen in the body, the hyperox chamber has been clinically designed to help the body function better. There's a lady who goes to... Uh, Calvary Baptist Church here in Pensacola, over on, uh, by the fairgrounds. What's the name of that road? Pine Forest Road. Okay. She, a uh, little short lady, she was in some kind of bad accident, and they said, she's going to die anyway. Let's put her in a hyperbaric chamber. And you're not supposed to be in for more than a couple hours. They put her in there and left her in for 56 and a half hours. And she says that is probably the world's record for anybody being under hyperbaric treatments, high-pressure oxygen, 56 and a half hours, I believe she said she was in there, 58 hours or something, I don't know. Maybe I'm getting Jessica confused because it's real close to the same. But um, she's fine today. Blind? No, not blind. They worried about extra oxygen causing blindness. She says, I, f I have absolutely no side effects. Oxygen... I'm not sure how the oxygen makes blindness. You know how that... One of the concerns was blind. I, I think it's capillaries in the eyes itself. It's actually, a, a, I guess, a uh, contraction or something. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the deal was. That's one of the things with diabetes too. The circulation they lose extremities, toes, fingers, you know, legs, and then and eyes also often go with diabetes. Um, but this, these chambers, you get in and pump it up. Of course, you probably have to somebody else have somebody else put you in and out, you know, of the chamber. Um, they now have a new model with a slightly larger window, so people wouldn't get quite so claustrophobic. But it's about $3,500 if you want to get one. Uh, Carl Baugh is the only source I have for this information. And some people say, where's the evidence? I want to see the evidence. I don't know that I can prove this. I'll just say, call Carl Baugh. I've seen in his office when I was there pictures, and I don't have a picture. All I have is a drawing. But I, there is a picture from a magazine in Japan of experiments done by Dr. Ki Mori at Keio University. And this is all right on the newspaper article there that he's got hanging on the wall. I photographed it. It didn't come out very good. Uh, hardly visible on the photograph that I took with the $10 camera I bought for the, for the occasion. But uh, I'll try to get a better picture. The story says that Dr. Mori was, of course, in Japan, property is extremely expensive. A little bitty apartment may cost you 2000 a month, you know. So he lived in a basement apartment. No windows. But the Japanese like to raise plants, you know, little bonsai plants and all this kind of stuff. So he started raising a tomato plant in his basement, but it had no windows. Since he worked at the university, 
he got a piece of fiber optic cable from the physics department. And he ran the fiber optic cable from the roof down through the wall to light his plant. How many have seen those? Uh, oh, Mom has one on the piano, doesn't she, where the lights turn under it and the, the little fiber optic like a little, looks like a little tree. The light comes out the end of the fiber optic cables. He was lighting his plant with fiber optic cable. The plant began growing faster than normal and producing more fruit than normal. So we thought, wow, why is this happening here? He theorized that possibly the fiber optic cable only allows in light. It won't allow in ultraviolet light. It's blocking it like sunglasses block UV light. And so he moved this plant to his um, university and put a plastic shield over it, which would do the effect of blocking out UV light, like sunglasses, okay? A UV blocker. He also knew that plants breathe carbon dioxide, and so he built a little st uh, sock around the stem of the plant that he could pressurize with carbon dioxide. Kind of like pumping up a little tire around this, just the stem of the plant, not the leaves, okay? If he could have done the leaves, it would have been much better, we assume. He pressurized CO2 to the stem of the plant. After two years, and again, according to Dr. Baugh and according to the article sitting on the wall of his place, which is from a newspaper, after two years, the plant was 16 feet tall and had produced 907 tomatoes. They moved it to a shopping center, built a bigger plastic shield over it, and again, they're only pressurizing carbon dioxide to the stem. To pressurize a room this size would be very difficult. You know, the windows are going to blow out. It's going to find a leak someplace. Okay? You can't, there's, there's really problems with getting large pressurized systems. One of the problems they have with spacecraft going up into a vacuum, you know, it's a big bubble up there ready to pop. Um, the story goes that they still have these seeds for sale, and it's still a big deal in the town of Otama and Aki. They need to learn to get real names over there, you know, for, uh, you know, like Chicago, stuff like that. Uh, but uh, these plants can still be purchased in these towns where they um, have extra large tomato plants that produce an extra amount of fruit. And so... According to the story, the plant kept growing, and the last time it was reported that I heard about, it was 40 feet tall and had produced 15,000 tomatoes during its lifetime. That wasn't per year, but during its lifetime, it had produced 15,000 tomatoes. Now, the tomatoes, were it's a cherry tomato plant, but his were baseball size. I mentioned this in my seminar, and a guy came to see me from University of Terre Haute, Indiana. He said, Mr. Hoven, I believe that's where it was. He said, Mr. Hoven, I just finished getting my Ph.D. in botany, raising plants. He said, what I did for my Ph.D. dissertation is I studied soybean plants to see how many beans they produce if you increase the carbon dioxide. Normal air we're breathing is very little CO2, 0.06%. Not much. Well, plants have to live on this. That's all they get. And they don't have lungs. They can't breathe it in. They've got to wait till it drifts by to absorb it. Well, if you pressurize CO2 and you increase the percentage, plants are going to grow like crazy. Now, the more plants grow, what do they put off? Oxygen. That's why you always feel refreshed when you go walk into a forest, you know, invigorated, like, wow, you know. They say if you put, put real plants in an office building, everybody works better because they get more oxygen. They stay alert longer. Um, the increased CO2, he, this guy told me he put 0.09% CO2. Instead of 0.06, it's 0.09, 50% boost. He said his Ph.D. dissertation dealt with this topic. He said uh, his soybean plants produce twice as many berries. They call them a soybean berry. Twice as many berries as regular plants. And he said, I only gave it a 50% boost, and I didn't even pressurize it. It would be a neat science fair experiment for some kid to do. would be to raise some plants inside a terrarium, glass cover, as a control, raise identical plants in another one, and every morning, break off a little piece of dry ice and drop it in. Dry ice is solid carbon dioxide. And that's what plants breathe. As it vaporizes, it'll produce lots of CO2 in there. You know, plants can only use so much. It's like you say, you know, would my car run faster if I had a 400-gallon gas tank? I don't know. It can only use so much at a time, right? And plants can't use, you know, 100% CO2 wouldn't help more than 50%.
somewhere along the line, you would reach what's called the, the point of diminishing returns. I don't know where that is, but that needs to be experimented on. If you try, you know, 0.09, 2%, 3%, and see where it starts to lose effectiveness, because now you've reached the saturation point, the plant just can't absorb anymore. But that'd be a neat experiment for some kid to do for a high school science fair project. Okay, so the cherry tomato plant uh, indicates that things were very different before the flood. I suspect this canopy of water explains why we had so much vegetation. Dr. Eugenius Scott is the president of an organization who's dedicated to getting creation, uh, keeping creation out of public schools. It is called the National Center for Science Education. The liberals and the communists always pick some name like that, you know, for the people, or the American way. You know, <laughs> they always make it look like they're the good guys. With, just by the name, they try to deceive people. Um, National Center for Science Education is actually a private organization started by Andrew Carnegie to keep creation out of the schools. I suspect there's a bigger picture here. Um, our founding fathers believed that we've got rights that come from God. And when you get folks believing they have rights that come from God, they don't make good slaves. And so if you want everybody to be enslaved in a new world order, you have to get, him, get, him, get those people to believe there is no creator and your rights come from the government. So evolution is really an essential teaching for those who would like a one world government. And guys like Carnegie, the billionaires, they would like all the money in the world. They have most of it, now they want the rest. Okay? And so it's to their advantage to make sure evolution is taught because it keeps the people dumber and keeps them easier to enslave with the big, big government programs. Okay. Dr. Eugenia Scott, anyway, is the president. I debated her on the radio in uh, November of 93. During the one-hour program, and I've got the audio tape of it, I believe I got to speak about nine minutes. She monopolized the entire conversation. I was trying to be a gentleman, assuming she was a lady. You know, uh, next time it'll be different, uh, Jeannie. Let's try it again sometime. I will demand equal time, okay? Anyway, she said in this, in, her, in this debate, she said, Now, Dr. Hovind, you say uh, the earth is only 6,000 years old. Do you realize, and here's a quote from her, there are 80 separate layers of coal in the Midwest. Let me stop right there and say she's right. If you look at the amount of coal in the world, the entire biomass of the world today could not possibly be converted to that much fossil fuel. Let me stop again and say she's right. Trees and plants and grass, when you smash it under enormous weight and pressure, turns to coal. Nobody argues that coal comes from plant material. I don't know, there may be a few out there, but I don't know anybody who disagrees with that. Okay, almost everybody agrees plants turn to coal if they're buried deep enough. Um, it is true, if you took every tree in the world today and buried it, you couldn't produce all the coal we have. Two true statements here. 80 separate layers of coal, there's not enough trees today to make all that. She said, there had to have been an enormous amount of time involved. Oh, stop right there. What's the problem with her logic here at this point? What? Doesn't take a long time to make coal. <laughs> Assuming a constant production of biomass, but a major assumption is she's looking at the world today which is 70% underwater. Was it that way when God created it? Where was most of the water that today is in the oceans? Under the crust of the earth. Let's just assume <coughs> the earth had several conditions different when it was first made. Let's just assume that it was only 20% oceans and 80% water, or land. Just and let's assume there were no massive ice caps and no massive deserts. And let's assume you had greater plant growth per acre because you have increased air pressure from a canopy and you have richer CO2. Now you're going to get 50 times more vegetation per acre and zillions of acres available for this vegetation to grow on. People often make the assumption, and Eric, when you get into debates and stuff, that they will say, how did he get kangaroos all the way from Australia to Noah's Ark? What are they assuming in that sentence? Assuming they had to start off in Australia, right? And they're assuming Australia was separate from the rest of the con from the world. Assuming there wasn't Australia. Assuming there wasn't Australia, right? People say, where was the Garden of Eden? 
I don't have a clue. They say, well, it had to be near Baghdad because, you know, they got the Tigris and Euphrates River. Now, there's a faulty assumption in that. They're assuming it's the same river mentioned in the Garden of Eden, in the Bible. Didn't people come from England, come over here and settle this place and call areas New York, named after York? Is that the same place? No. It reminded them of that place, so they gave it that name, right? New Hampshire. There's thousands of cities in America named after European cities. There's a Moscow, Missouri. Probably what happened after the flood, Noah's family got off the ark, and they said, you know, that river looks like the Euphrates River. Let's call it Euphrates. Okay. They got to decide. I mean, they're the only ones left. You know? <laughs> Pick any name you want. <laughs> right? They're calling the shots. And so people, uh, they read the Bible, and they, they, we, we, we got to be careful, and we don't assume things, because you make, you know, make a mess out of, uh, out of the truth. So, she's right, there's too much coal to be formed by the trees today, but she's wrong to say it would take an enormous amount of time. What it would take was a different world, with lots more trees, all destroyed in a flood. Now, during a flood, what's going to happen to trees? They're going to float for a while, until they get waterlogged, then they sink. How badly torn up they are will determine how fast the water soaks in. What species they are determines, you know, how fast the water soaks in. All sorts of factors involved here. But they're going to slowly settle out and form a layer of trees at the bottom of this ocean during the flood. Meanwhile, you've got more sediments dropping down because it's muddy water from the fountains of the deep being broken up, and it's going to cover these trees. Now you have another layer, uh, what's called a log mat, a big pile of floating debris. It's going to float by and drop off another few hundred feet, maybe, of broken tree branches, leaves, etc. And that's going to coalify. And they find seams of coal up to 100 feet thick. The thickest I've ever read about is 120 feet. Have you been down in a coal mine yet, Eric? You went down in a gold mine, right? Up in uh, Birmingham, a guy took me down inside the coal mine where he worked. We had to go down at 3 in the mornings to make sure, you know, it was okay with the boss, because the third shift boss was a little more lenient, because nobody's down there. But uh, we went down in this coal mine way down there, and he said, now, hang on to something. I'm going to shut the lights off. When he shut the lights off, it was so black. I was going, <laughs> where is everybody, you know? He said, you can stay down here for the rest of your life, and you'll never see your hand in front of your face. Your eyes will never get used to this, because there is no light. But as we're going through this coal, where we were, it was maybe 12 feet thick of solid coal. It was, you could see logs had been pressed into the ceiling and pressed into the floor. Whole logs, 80 feet long. And sometimes you'd see pieces of logs, coalified, sticking out of the sides where they hadn't dug them out yet. Just solid. It was the neatest thing. In the old days, they would dig coal out with a pick and shovel, you know, and, and the guys got to see things that are found in the coal. Many years ago, they developed a machine that's about the size of this room, and the, the driver is 22 feet away from the auger that's grinding up, the, you know, eating its way into the wall and putting it onto a conveyor belt and shooting. He never sees what's going on. He never sees the stuff coming out. So if any human artifacts are found buried in coal, they're very unlikely to be found today just because of the way coal is mined. But in the old days, lots of things were found in coal. Okay, next week we will try to finish up on the canopy, what it, was, what it may have been like before the flood, and what some of the effects were. You know, why did they live to be 900 years old? How do we find these giant animals, giant insects? And I've given you some of the evidence against the canopy theory, the complaints they have. We're going to give you some of the evidence for the canopy theory. One of those would be we find amber with increased oxygen. Something was different. We find evidence of animals like dinosaurs that have small lungs, small nostrils. They had to have greater air pressure and or greater oxygen concentration. Those are two of the lines of evidence that there must have been something different before the flood. The biggest line of evidence, I think, for the canopy theory is the Bible says there was water above the atmosphere. What's the size of insects? The size of we'll get into that next week. right? The so insects are found that are gigantic, and they can't absorb oxygen today because of the surface area to volume ratio problem. We'll get into all that next week. Thank you so much. Dismissed.